Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we welcome back John McHugh and today we're going to be tackling witnessing Jesus's celestial sea walk. John, over to you. Uh, yeah, so I'll just, uh, Esoterica, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. Um, it's an honor to be on the show and uh, I just, as far as my background goes, um, I, I, I'm, I don't mean to be self-effacing at all, but it, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm your average bear as scholars go, but I ask very different questions because I was raised devoutly Roman Catholic and I was never able to reconcile miracles with science. So I have spent like my whole life trying to figure out how this was done. How did people in Jesus's day feel comfortable writing about uh, this child being born to a virgin or resurrecting from the dead or walking on water or raising people from the dead. And so anyway, uh, I got a, got a degree in uh, graduate degree in archaeology from Brigham Young University, which is a Mormon university. I'm, I'm not Mormon, but it's a very religious university. What, what it offered me is the opportunity to, to do a lot of we're right here in American Southwest. So I have a, a minor expertise in Native American rock art. Uh, the, the American Southwest is covered with thousands and thousands of prehistoric Native American uh, rock art panels that there it's really picture writing. It's almost like a pictographic script, really beautiful. Um, and then Brigham Young University also had a lot of ancient languages that I got to study. Um, so I, had, I know a handful of reading knowledge of a handful of ancient languages like Akkadian and, you know, um, Biblical Hebrew and, you know, classical Greek and Aramaic and stuff like Nabataean, stuff like that. So anyway, um, I, I, I just have been fascinated with this since I was a child um, as I go into, into the book. So, my, so but the, the difference is a modern scholar would look at something that's not testable and just not touch it. They're like, look, if I can't make this a testable argument, I'm just not gonna try to, to touch it. Whereas, you know, today we're talking about uh, witnessing Jesus's celestial sea walk. Um, I'll say, how did the gospel authors write down that Jesus were, walked on water? How did they know that, that there's the script? jarring discrepancies in the story that we'll go into. And I'm almost acting like a paleopsychologist. I'm almost saying, hey, why did Matthew write it this way? Why did Mark write it this way? Why did John write it this way? And to blow your, your viewer's mind, why did Luke not write the story down at all? He didn't write the, the Seawalk story down uh, as far as Jesus's miracles go. So it's those questions I'm trying to resolve um, that I, I, I fixated would be a little bit too soft of a word. I almost get just absolutely mesmerized by them and I, I can't let them go until I feel like I've resolved them. So, um, so having said that, um, if, you know, if you know, mommy, you, you know, I've got to, for Monkfish, I've got to uh, popularize the book a little bit. So if you don't mind me sharing my screen with you. Uh, so I'm gonna, gonna uh, just go to share screen. There we go. And uh, I'll pull it up and share. And there we go. We got a full screen. Okay. So the book is called uh, The Celestial Code of Scripture. And the, uh, the, uh, the subheading really summarizes what the book is about. It's the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. And, you know, I'm John McHugh. Um, ironically, I, I'm a uh, I was adopted from a, a Catholic orphanage in Southwest Philadelphia. And I was adopted into a devoutly Irish Catholic family. My dad, uh, for instance, uh, said all the prayers in Latin because he was an altar boy when the, when the, uh, the mass was still said in Latin. So um, we were taught maybe not to believe the Bible literally truthfully, but, but it was historic and it had entirely 100% spiritual truth. So, um, so 
I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time getting to my next screen here. So let me just try to figure this one out. Here we go. Oh, there we go. So um, th this kind of summarizes what the book's about, okay? Um, so when I was at Brigham Young University, I stumbled onto an ar arcane celestial thinking paradigm unlike any we embrace today. This esoteric doctrine held that the constellations depicted still frames of all the monumental incidents that had taken place on Earth alternate readings for the cuneiform signs that were used to spell out the oldest constellation titles in each stellar tableau divulged the details and the action that was taken place in each astral scene. Hence, in the ancient world, the constellations depicted an infallible repository of mythical history, which cuneiform sources refer to as heavenly writing or constellation writing. Religious astrologers such as the Magi that followed the star of Bethlehem baby Jesus arranged the, the jumbled array of stellar snapshots in their accompanying missives in the narratives, which were then recorded as history in pagan religious mythology, the Bible and the Quran. And that's really what the book is about. To put it simply, um, the Celestial Code of Scriptures basically says that many of the iconic miracles reported in the Bible and the Quran, they correspond to pictures or tableaus in the oldest Mesopotamian star atlases, which are written, of course, in cuneiform. Um, and then there's a the nuance here that's really hard to comprehend is that that I, I use the term wordplay. It's not really the right term. Polysemy is the right word. Polysemy just means multiple meanings in a word or phrase. It's polysemy in the constellations cuneiform titles that that correspond to the details and the action in the miracle stories. And that's um, that's really what the book's about. Uh, the book traces Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to a picture in the stars, traces the scenes from Noah's flood, including Noah's Ark, there's two of them, uh, to pictures in the stars. Uh, Samson's slaughter of a thousand men to uh, a picture in, uh, in the vicinity of Taurus. Uh, Jonah's confinement in the sea monster's belly, that can be traced to a picture in the Mesopotamian constellations. Jesus' virgin birth and sea walk are documented in the Celestial Code of Scripture, traced to pictures in the stars. Uh, Revelation 12, where John um, has a vision in which he sees a woman, a child, and a, and a red dragon that's about to devour the child. That can be that that image is found in right out of Mesopotamian star atlases. Um, Saint Christopher, the giant who carries baby Jesus across the river, uh, one of my favorite stories. Uh, that, that can be traced to a, a picture of Orion uh, doing that in the stars. And the Islamic claim that the Quran was based on the celestial tablet in heaven, and also Muhammad's encounter with the angel Gabriel, that also can be traced to pictures in the stars. That's what the book's about. So uh, today's presentation, is we're just going to focus on Jesus's seawalk miracle. It really, next to his resurrection, this is really the signature miracle. You know, even it's even found its way into our common vernacular. You, you, you have a really hard day at work and you say, you think you want it done by when? You, you, do you think I can walk on water or something like that? It becomes this kind of, you know, this kind of uh, euphemism for, for doing the miraculous, right? So there's a, a painting of Jesus walking on water out to the, the, the apostles uh, floundering boat. Um, so chapter 11 of the Celestial Code of Scripture is called Jesus's Celestial Seawalk. Um, and I believe our presentation today is called Witnessing Jesus' Celestial Sea Walk, because you're going to see that it's founded on a picture in the stars. So I um, thought I would include this here. Um, this is a, uh, a, a baptistry um, painting. It's the earliest painting of Jesus' Sea Walk miracle. So what you see there is um, you see uh, the in the lower part of that figure below the boat, that's Peter sinking below the waves and reaching out to Jesus. The figure that is broken off is Jesus. And this painting dates to about AD 240. So it's the earliest depiction of this seawalk miracle. Um, but this is what gets me. As somebody who's raised a valley Roman Catholic, I had conversations with the nuns, like you wouldn't believe these impassioned conversations. Only a few times did I get smacked, but the, you're, you're looking at, I'm going to present the, the irreconcilable 
uh, aspects of the story. And it's going to feel like you're going to feel like you have a whiplash after you see these these jolting uh, incongruencies. So let me just point a few of them out. So in Matthew's version of the sea walk miracle, he tells us that Peter walks on water towards Jesus, as you saw in that picture. Everything's going great. He notices the strong wind. His faith becomes weak and he sinks below the waves. Then he has to reach out to Jesus. Okay. So, okay, fair enough. So why didn't Mark report that? Mark didn't say anything about it. If you were on the boat and you saw Jesus walking on water and you saw, you know, Peter walking out, step out of the boat and start walking towards Jesus on the water before he sank, you would be like, wait a minute. Why didn't you write this down? You know, of course it would be written down. That's the first incongruency. But the second part, if you look at Mark uh, chapter 6, verse 48, he literally says, and Jesus wanted to go by them. So I found, I did find this picture on the internet where Jesus, as you can see, is walking on water and he has his back to the boat. What Mark is implying is that Jesus walked out on the Sea of Galilee and literally walked past the disciples, you, you know, sinking ship. It's about to capsize in the waves. And he walks past them. Is this some kind of archaic joke? I mean, what, what is going on here? Why did Mark write something so uh, absurd? Or is the only thing that comes to mind. And John includes a second miracle. He says that um, in uh, John uh, chapter 6, verse 21, he says that, uh, that as soon as Jesus stepped into the boat, the boat immediately came to the land where they were going. Now, the reason that's a second miracle is because the Sea of Galilee is about, um, it's, about it's, it's about seven miles wide. And Jesus has encountered the boat after walking out uh, onto the Sea of Galilee for 20 or 30 stadia. And a stadia is about, um, it's about 200 yards. You know, so it's about 200 yards. So you're talking about three or four miles. So when they took Jesus into the boat, you know, and the, the, the winds calm, the boat immediately made, made it the other three or four miles to the shore. And that would have just been something that was unforgettable if, if it were eyewitness testimony. You wouldn't miss it. You'd be like, whoa, we just literally teleported to the other side of the lake instantaneously. And we were expecting it to take several hours before we got there. So they're the things that interest me the most. And then if you really want to talk about incongruencies, Luke doesn't write the story down. Like I had arguments. In fact, one of my nuns, I said, she wrote this down as a homework assignment. She said, you're going to read about Jesus the sea walk. And I, she writes it up on the board. I copied down in my notepad. And I said, hey, sister, her name was Sister Regina. I said, you forgot to write Luke's version of the Seawalk miracle. And she was kind of embarrassed. And she said, he didn't write it down. Like, well, he didn't write it down. What do, you, what do you mean he didn't write it down? Like, how do you not write? A guy walks out on water for three or four miles. How do you not write that down? So one of the great mysteries, right? So there are some common themes that show up in all the versions of the story. So Jesus goes up on a mountain to pray. He, he goes up on a mountain. He does it because he wants to pray. He's alone when he does it. And then while the apostles have taken a boat out into the Sea of Galilee, a strong wind threatens to capsize their boat. Okay. And then another thing that's included in Matthew and Mark's version of the Sea Walk miracle is they, they say that it occurs at the fourth watch of the night which is between three and six in the morning. There were four watches of the night. Um, they were, if I remember correctly, off the top of my head in Roman, in, in, in Roman astro astronomy, they were three hours each. So the, site, the night was broken into four three hour watches. And so that would put us at between three and six in the morning. And some, uh, in some Bibles, it actually renders it as three to six in the morning because that's what the fourth watch of the night means. So you're like, Hmm, okay, interesting. So the, the questions that 
are, are sparked in me are obvious. So how did the gospel officers know that Jesus had walked upon the sea? Like, how did they know that? Um, so how did they come up with these absolutely irreconcilable discrepancies in the story? How? You, you just can't merge Matthew's version where Peter is walking on the water with Jesus with John's version where the boat teleports three or four miles to the other side of the lake. They just don't even work. Like, and then, so, so how did they get these different versions of the story and all come to the conclusion that they were unequivocal truth? There was absolute truth. There was nothing to question. So the point to interject for your viewers right now is, is really this. So, and, and they say it in the uh, Oxford Annotated Bible. Um, so they, they mentioned that, you know, that the early evangelists, the, the people who wrote down the Gospels, they were not uh, concerned with any kind of um, historical analysis and, co and comparison of their passages. They, they, they were writing down stories 40 to 60 years after the life of Jesus. They, they didn't, they had little, if zero, eyewitness testimony of Jesus' life and teachings. So if this is so, if, if what so many theologians who have written in the Oxford Annotated Bible, you're, they're the best in the world, if they're willing to say that, how did you get a similar story of a sea walk with so many just absolutely all startling discrepancies, but a basically the same story. So I'm gonna start with this idea. Again, you gotta go into the ancient mind. I don't have a problem. You're not allowed to do it because you'll get rejected if you try to publish in a scholarly journal. You're not supposed to do paleopsychology. And that's all this book's about is paleopsychology. So, um, so the first thing you got to do to understand Jesus' seawalk sea is you've got to understand that in Jesus' era, it was commonplace for people to believe that pictures in the stars documented historic events that had once occurred on Earth. And these weren't just any old mundane events. They were supernatural events, events that we would call miracles. So... And you look up in the night sky and the Greek and Roman stars literally are just littered with them. You got Perseus right there. There's a picture from the second cen century Parnesi star atlas. Uh, that's what uh, Claudius Ptolemy, um, his, his uh, Almagest, his constellation list in Almagest is what the uh, Parnesi star atlas is based on. So you've got Perseus carrying Medusa's head through the stars. You've got the, from that severed head, you've got the birth of Pegasus. You've got Cetus there poised to devour Andromeda. You've got Cassiopeia sentenced to a chair where she's forced to spin around the pole star, spending half of uh, each night upside down. Just, you have these supernatural events. They're, they're, they're preternatural. They, they cannot be based on what we would call science. And that's the first step in understanding this. It wasn't based on science. It was based on another thinking paradigm. In fact, the Greeks had a term for it. Uh, it was called catasterism, which is, I think with the case ending, it's catasterismos, which is placing among the stars. That's literally what it means. That's how you became an immortal in heaven. You had to do something that was so noteworthy that it would be etched among the stars. So, and to hammer that point home, so now we're looking at Hesiod. Uh, Hesiodus, I think is how you would say it in Greek, right? So he writes a text called the Astronomia. Uh, it just means astronomy, right? And in that text, he talks about the, the Pleiades myth, he talks about the great bear, how it became a constellation. And he especially talks about my favorite, one of my favorite celestial myths, which is the Orion Scorpius myth. And um, so let me just give you the words from the, from the story. Uh, Orion went away to Crete and spent his time hunting in the company of Artemis and Leto. It seems that he threatened to kill every beast there was on earth, whereupon in her anger, the goddess earth, set up against him a scorpion of very great size by which he was stung and so perished. 
after this, Zeus, who's, you know, this planet god Jupiter, at the prayer of Artemis and Leto, put him among the stars because of his manliness and his scorpion also as a memorial of him and of what had occurred. So that still frame replays itself every time you see Orion set in the constellations. Orion is depicted as a hero. He's turned around warily looking behind him. And as he's setting, the giant zodiacal scorpion is rising in the east. Now, the reason this so fascinates me, number one, is that Orion and Scorpius existed in Mesopotamian star atlases that are 2,000 years, I mean, at least 1,000 years, if not 1,500 years older than Hesiod's uh, testimony to this event in 700 BC. So they're saying it's autochthonous Greek celestial mythology, but in reality, they've adopted those constellations from Mesopotamia. So, but here's where it starts to get really intriguing. And this is what got my attention. When you look at this story in Hesiod, uh, in the Astronomia, um, it also talks about, uh, so yeah, so let me just see. Um, sorry, I, I, I may have gotten out of my slides here. So, uh, so there's a still frame in the stars, right? Um, so there's an, so picturing, accepting pictures in the stars as scenes of monumental historic events, I think we can all grasp onto that. In Mesopotamia, they have another term. They call it Lamashi writing. And it's the idea that the constellations titles had alternate readings or poly polysemous readings that imparted or channeled divine truth to the astrologers and the astronomers who were able to decode these messages. Um, in essence, it's wordplay embedded in constellation titles. So, um, so now here's where it gets really remarkable. So in that same text that talks about uh, Orion and Scorpius getting placed in the stars as a chase scene frozen in time, the prelude to that story says this, Orion, so of Oriel, the daughter of Minos and of Poseidon, and that there was given to him as a gift the power of walking upon the waves as though upon land. Orion could walk on water. And when I read that, I remember I was getting ready to do a presentation at Creighton University in, um, in Nebraska, a Catholic university. It was my very first presentation. It was in the late 1990s. And I hit the, that line. And I was like, oh my God, Orion could walk on water. Later, after grad school, I didn't have time to pursue it at the time. Um, I had to pursue it. And uh, so what you find is Apollodorus, he's, he's called Pseudo, he's called Pseudo Apollodorus. He's writing in the second century AD, but he's referring to celestial mythology that is far older. And he says, this uh, Poseidon bestowed on him, meaning him being an Orion, the power of striding across uh, uh, the sea. Virgil, uh, certainly far before Jesus is, is born, says Orion, when cleaving a path, um, he stalks on foot through the vast uh, pools of mid-ocean, towers with his shoulders above the waves. And then uh, the, the astronomer, uh, Gaius uh, Julius Higinus, writes, Orion had the ability of running over the waves as if on land. And that's written at least two decades before Jesus walks on water. So you have ancient testimony before Jesus walks on water, that Orion could walk on water before Jesus. Good. So when you actually plot Orion in the stars, what you find is that he's actually stepping out. His, in fact, he shares a star. The first star in the river constellation is also his front foot star. Um, I believe it's called Rigel. And... Um, uh, you can just look it up in the star atlases like in Eratus. So, but what a lot of people who aren't amateur astronomers or astronomers professionally don't realize that there's a celestial sea in the stars. And they mes mention it all the time in Mesopotamian star atlases. And that sea is comprised of Delphinus, the dolphin, Capricorn, the goatfish, uh, 
the water god who's Ea. Uh, he's the god of the flood. There's a southern fish constellation, Pisces There's Pisces, the twin fishes. There's Kedis, the sea monster constellation. There's Eridanus, the river. And there's Argo, the ship. And they're circumscribed. Those eight constellations make a sea in the stars. And Orion is stepping out away from land onto that sea. So the question is, is Jesus walking on water in the guise of Orion? Is the story somehow being remembered according to this picture? And so my argument is that, that the, the gospel authors had zero, little, a, a smidgen of eyewitness testimony, if zero. So how did they come up possibly with the idea that Orion embodied Jesus and that he was walking on water? What could possibly do that? Well, now we got to talk to wordplay, talk about wordplay and divine revelation. Um, wordplay, you know, you hear this in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, Jesus says to Peter, he says, you are rock and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. That's the, the standard pun. The Catholic Church identifies that pun as the, as the basis for Jesus being the first pope. So literally, the, the, the papal office in Roman Catholicism is, is founded on wordplay that Jesus used when he was talking to Peter, Peter's name being Rock. So, but that idea is, is so prevalent and deeply embedded in Mesopotamian uh, spirituality and celestial wisdom that it's worth looking into. So in the ancient world, if we think of puns as, as, as fun, as like humor and witticism and, you know, I just broke my humorous. Was that humorous? You know, something like that, something goofy like that. You know, and in the word in, in the ancient world, wordplay was of utmost importance. And you would literally like, for instance, in, in America, you know, we're about to come to our midterms during the elections. Could you imagine if it were 2000 years ago, people would be looking at people's names and saying, hey, let's find somebody whose name means he or she will be a good leader or something to that effect. Um, and we just don't think like that today. So. And the reason that it's so, part of the reason it's so different is the Greek and Roman constellations didn't originate in Greece and Rome. They originated in Mesopotamia and they were adopted by the Greeks and Romans. And here we get into nuances that are so different than the way we think today that you have to go into them to understand Jesus' seawalk. So when, if you were, could go back to 2000 BC in ancient Babylonia and you could talk to an astrologer, the astrologer wouldn't have, his name wouldn't have any, his, it's mostly he, so I'm not going to try to be sexist here, but what I'm saying is most astrologers were he's, there were some females who were trained who were in the court of the king, but for the most part, your astrologer was a male, and his name was Dupcharu, which literally means writer, it's like author, you know, and, and the reason that the astronomer and the astrologer, I used the terms interchangeable because they meant the same thing in the ancient world. Astronomy and astrology was the same word. Um, the, the term for astronomer is writer because the starry sky was seen as writing. It was literally shittir shameh, which means heavenly writing. You could translate it as celestial writing. You could write it. You could also translate it as writing of the stars. Um, and what the astrologer had to do is translate this celestial writing and predict the future with it so that uh, they could help the king exploit auspicious circumstances that would occur and avoid inauspicious ones, like a, an assassination attempt on the king uh, and exploit things like uh, you know, capacious wheat harvest, okay? If we're gonna have a great wheat harvest and let's make sure we store that and we can sell it as surplus and make some extra money. So, and here's where, you know, one of the great scholars of uh, punning in the ancient world is a guy named Scott Nogel. And, you know, I'm just gonna hit the, the basics here, but he would say that writing was considered of divine origins 
puns provided diviners, including the astrologers, with interpretive strategies. Interpretive strategies means making sense of the world around us, whether that be the future or the past. Um, the reason is connected to the idea that words were considered the embodiment of the object or idea they represented. If you wrote the word tree in cuneiform, the word tree was considered a concentrated form of the idea tree. And we don't hold that idea anymore, maybe because it came from a picture. Um, so individual words contain the power of the essence, of an essence of an object. There was a whole envelope of information that came with every cuneiform sign or part of a word. Again, alphabetic scripts just can't convey this kind of information. And that's why the stuff I do ends up being really esoteric. It's not actually that complicated. They do it all the time in cuneiform writing, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, in the flood story, in uh, the, the famous creation story of the Babylonians called Enuma Elish, especially in Tablet 7. So when you look at cuneiform writing, you come across this really uh, esoteric and uh, arcane idea, which is uh, they use the term amatitsirti, which means hidden words. What we would today call wordplay, puns, double entendre. I like the word polysemy because it means multiple meanings in a word or phrase. And hidden words are parish to sha'ili. They're the secrets of the gods. And in fact, they're so powerful that when an astrologer or some other diviner, it could be somebody doing an, uh, uh, a dissection of the liver of a, of a sheep, for instance, um, when they find a word play, they literally say, hey, this is a secret of the gods. The uninitiated cannot see this. It would be spiritually dangerous if you revealed this information to an uninitiated scholar who didn't know the prayers involved with controlling the deities, with having them look favorably on you. You've got you to do offerings, you've got to do prayers, you've got to know what you're doing. I had an experience once when I was excavating. Um, I, I was at a site in central Utah called pa Capitol Reef National Park, and I was excavating with Navajo. One of the Navajo was, a, uh, was an elder and, and a shaman. And, you know, I'm trying to be this, I mean, you know, I'm in my grad school and I'm trying to be this cool, groovy guy who's hip, who's in touch with Native American spirituality. And I, and I would draw a picture of an image that we were looking at in rock art. And I asked the question, I said, yay. And uh, yay is just like sort of a Navajo word that sort of means gods. It's sort of our word for deity. And the younger son of this elder case kept, erasing my picture in the sand. I was like, well, what's the problem? And he said, look, you got to stop doing that. I was like, I'm like, well, why, why, why? He goes, if you draw a picture of the deity, you've just made the deity present with us. Do you know the prayers that are necessary to control the deity? And I'm like, no. And so the kid goes, so let's not get us all killed. So let's not do this anymore. I'm like, okay, point taken. I, I won't do that anymore. And then, you know, the, the, the elder didn't speak English and he just nodded with me. It was obviously a nod of thanks, like, don't be stupid, okay? So this is sort of a similar idea. So uh, the reason wordplay shows up, again, I gotta do this, I hate having to do this, but it, it, it's embedded in cuneiform writing because of the way cuneiform writing evolves. Sumerians have, uh, invent cuneiform writing around 3000 BC. They use it to write their Sumerian language. The language isolate. In fact, it's like Navajo. There's no other language like it. Uh, you know, the reason, part of the reason uh, we were able to, uh, defeat, Americans were able, able to defeat the Japanese is we had the wind talkers. So we, we just had Navajos were the, uh, they were the radio operators during World War II. They just said, look, just speak your language. Nobody can, nobody's going to decode this. It's too hard. So they would just speak their language back and forth. And that's part of the reason why we were able to um, defeat the Japanese because our radio operators were all Navajo speaking the language isolate that couldn't be cracked. It was a language that just couldn't be cracked. And if you've ever heard the Navajo language, you're like, 
okay, I think that was important. I have no idea what you just said, but there's no cognates. It's really remarkable. But anyway, so the Sumerians have a similar language, and a language isolate. It's borrowed by a Semitic speaking language ethnicity. And they are called the, what we know as the Akkadian speaking people. They use the Kinnearform, Sumerian Kinnearform script to write their language. These Akkadian speakers are who we come to know of as the Babylonians of Southern Mesopotamia and the Assyrians of Northern Mesopotamia. And the Babylonians are the first ones who are writing unequivocal uh, astronomical star atlas, uh, star atlases and astronomical diaries around 2000 BC, okay? And so, but the Sumerian language gets retained in this Akkadian uh, writing system, the Semitic writing system through Sumerian logograms. And then you just get into a cuneiform sign. That's the cuneiform sign on. It just means it's literally the Sumerian word for God. It can be read dingir, God, or it can be read on, which means heavens in Sumerian. But it represents the Akkadian word shamu, which is skies or heavens. And it can be read dingir and represent the Akkadian word ilu, which means gods. Uh, but it can mean a whole bunch of other languages. And this is where polysemy comes in. Every cuneiform sign, there's 600 of them, has secondary meanings, and the astrologers know that. So when they write a cuneiform title based on the star atlases, they know that there are hidden words in each title. And that's what they're looking for and seeing as a revelation. The, you know, so when you wrote this one cuneiform sign, which shows up all the time, it can mean skies, heavens, gods, uh, belonging to me, it can mean star, barley, ear, and hailing of, and taboo, right? And one of the things that really uh, I want to hammer home in the oldest form of cuneiform writing, that cuneiform sign for God was written with the image of a star, which sort of under, it, it betrays the idea that the stars were the deities. Um, and I love uh, emphasizing that point because we don't think of it that way today. Um, so another word that shows up before constellation titles, it's called a celestial determinative. It's the cuneiform sign mul, right? Well, it can be read, you could write it mul, if you look at the top of the screen, mul without a little number next to it, and then mul number two. And then if you keep going down, there's a mul number four, a mul number five, and a mul x. Every one of those ways is, is a way to write the cuneiform sign star in Akkadian, which means it's the word kakabu. And again, there's five different ways to do it. The only one that's not used for star is mul number three. And I'm, I don't want to go into the boring, boring reason why not. But so if you, so every single cuneiform star and every single constellation written in a cuneiform star atlas can have one of these five cuneiform signs written in front of it. And it just means star con constellation. It's just a celestial determinative. In cuneiform writing, if you have, um, they have um, determinatives and they just mark certain, they're noun markers. If things are made out of wood, you use a cuneiform sign called gish. If they're made, uh, if they're celestial, you write to cuneiform sign mul, which meant star. Anyway, not to get boring or anything, but they also mean a whole bunch of other words that I don't want to go into. But this is where all the polysemy starts to occur. Every astrologer knows that there are probably 30 or 40 or 50 different secondary meanings that could reveal a revelation about a certain constellation or stellar tableau in the constellations, okay? And so when you write cuneiform sign mul, it can mean star, constellation, God, shining brightly, inscription, writing, arrow, foundation, ornament, pierce, wood, wasp, watercourse, distant time, fruit, feeling, elated, field, cow, moon, and month. I'm sorry I had to go through that. I hope everyone's still with me. That's how it shows up in cuneiform writing. So I'm just, again, I give your reader, your viewers some example of this. A new middle you can write it, you can read it. It's in a Mesopotamian, um, I forget. Uh, Stephanie Daly does a wonderful book in English 
that has, I forget, it's like Mesopotamian writing or something like that. But it has a numeral tablet, you know, tablet seven. And when you look at tablet seven, every single line, I've got them right here. So like 163 lines of this cuneiform writing, uh, tablet seven of a numeral -ish, every one of the 163 lines is based on punning. It's based on wordplay. And line 128 is a really easy one to, to decipher because it's based on an epithet for the, the god Jupiter. So the god Jupiter is just Marduk. Marduk, and uh, it's the supreme Babylonian and Assyrian deity. And um, one of his epithets is Dingir Nibiru. It just means Jupiter when he's crossing the midpoint of the sky. Literally, it means the god crossing because he's crossing the midpoint of the sky. And that's where the name comes from. So that's the name, but that's not how you write the name. How you write the name is Dean Gerd Nebiru. They got to write out in this cumbersome script, they got to use four cuneiform signs to write it out. Dean Gerd, name number two, Biru. Okay. So literally, it's just the god Nibiru. The God crossing. Okay, everybody's not having a hard time with that. But remember, every one of those cuneiform signs means other words. So they knew that you could write mul with many different mul signs. One of them was the mul two sign, which also means they cause to appear. The Dean Gear sign that I just mentioned, that on sign, can mean God, it can mean star, and it can mean skies. The Ne2 sign, for whatever reason, they didn't use it for anything. The cuneiform sign B can represent the Akkadian word, that's the Babylonian and Syrian word that means Shu, his. And the Ru sign uh, can represent um, Ina, uh, which is, uh, it can mean Sha and Ina, which means, um, which is which and in. So you put those down and they, and they just make a coherent sentence out of that. The God Nibiru, there's no verb of being, you have to insert the verb of being. So the God Nibiru is his star, which in the skies they cause to appear. And if you look at line 128 from the Numa Elish, Tablet 7, the Babylonian creation story, that's what it says. And they literally got it from wordplay in an epithet for the, uh, for the God uh, Marduk Jupiter. So, okay. So I said, well, there we go. Now we can get to the fun stuff. I had to go through that. I hope everyone's still with me. I hope your, your viewers don't hate me now because I just had to drag them through all that boring cuneiform uh, grammar. But you need to know it. And that's the boring stuff I do you know, every, every day. So witnessing Jesus' celestial sea walks. Now you're like, all right, well, could wordplay have anything to do with Orion becoming Jesus? Well, I'm going to venture yes. And here's why because there's about 12 or 15 different titles for Orion. He, Orion's often referred to as a shepherd or a son. Um, so one of his titles, uh, his archaic Sumerian titles is Dingir Damu. Dingir, as we just saw, means God. Damu is just a Sumerian term that for son as an S-O-N, son, like male child. Another term for Orion, he's referred to as Mul Sukal, which means the constellation messenger. You could me, messenger would be an okay translation of that. However, those cuneiform signs that you would look up there on the upper left, Dingir Damu and Mul Sukal, they have other meanings. So Damu, Damu just means son. It's the Sumerian word for son, S-O-M. Dingir can mean deity, of course. And it's also a it's an it's a Sumerian logogram for the Akkadian word sha, which means up. So Dingir Damu also renders in hidden puns the son of God. And Sukha, which means messenger, also represents a, a cuneiform, uh, an Akkadian cuneiform term. Again, when I say Akkadian, I'm talking about Babylonian and Assyrian. So that, a Babylon, that Babylonian and Assyrian word, Hashishu, that's literally anointed one. It's kind of priest. It's the anointed one priest. And 
So you had the son of God and the anointed one. Well, Peshishu is that sukkah that means Peshishu. That's another term for Christ. That's what Christos means. It means anointed one, right? So all of a sudden, you have Orion being identified as the son of God and the anointed one. And there are two terms that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John embraced. They didn't have any eyewitness testimony, but they did view the starry sky as a pictographic script, and they did view Jesus as the son of God and the anointed one. So they're like, well, wait a minute. I, I know cuneiform. <laughs> well, one of Orion's titles is, it means the, you know, the sun God, the S-O-N God, and it also can render a son of God. Well, that's what Jesus is. Well, wait a minute. The constellation title for Orion is Mosukau. Well, wait a minute. Sukau also represents Pashishu. That's anointed one. That's Christ. Oh, I bet Orion embodies Christ. That's where that connection comes from. It's coming right out of wordplay. Uh, what they would call in Kaneaform Lumashi writing or constellation writing. So, so all of a sudden you have Orion embodying Jesus, but it goes a little further. Um, so the Kaneaform title, uh, you know, that one that says Mu, well, Mu can be read Shuhu, and Shuhu can mean to tread upon. Mu can also be read Nab. And by the way, these are right out of atlases. Like, I'm not making this stuff up. Like, you can look it up. That's why it's in the footnotes in my book. So Mu can be read Nab. And um, so Nab just means see. So you're like, wait a minute. Orion is the son of God. He's the anointed one. And he treads upon the sea. Okay. Now we got Jesus walking on the sea. Okay. So that's how they probably got there. So you're like, well, in all of the stories, Jesus steps away from a mountain before he walks on water. So all I'm trying to do is give your readers a picture of the sea walk miracle. So you can realize that Jesus's sea walk was based on a stellar tableau in the Mesopotamian constellation. So he steps away. Jesus and Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke didn't write the story down, unfortunately. Matthew, Mark, and John. Jesus steps away from the mountain right before walking on water. Well, so you're like, well, I know, you know, I already know this. So I'm like, oh my God, this, you, I just keep saying, I don't mean to sound cocky or flippant. Could it really be that easy? Could it really be that easy? So I'm like, well, look, in, you know, in Mesopotamia, Gemini is a mountain constellation, is a, is a twin constellation, but it's a twin mountain. It's the mountain that Gilgamesh climbs in his Epic of Gilgamesh. So it's right behind Jesus. And you could see how the gospel officers, if they're looking at this picture story as the basis of Jesus' seawalk, you'd say, well, wait a minute. There's a mountain in this story. We need to somehow incorporate that in the story. So Jesus steps away from the mountain. And by the way, it's an unnamed mountain. They just call, call it Oros in Greek. It, they don't give you a specific name. And I'm, I'm suggesting that that's coming right out of the star, the star atlases, the stellar picture that Jesus uh, is embedded within when he's walking on water. So you're like, okay, well, there's, there's the mountains that Jesus walks away from. But where's the apostle ship? There's one ship in this stellar tableau, and it's Argo. Could the Argo somehow be the apostle ship? Well, uh, uh, I think, in, uh, I'm, look, I'm going off of the Greek now. Yeah, it's, it's Methetes is the it's the Greek word for disciples, Methetes. And interestingly, the cuneiform title for Argo, um, I mentioned it in one of the videos we did about the, it's the original, by the way, the Mul Magor, that's the original flood, though. that's the original Ark. Um, so it's the, literally Mul Magor means constellation boat, and then the Gore can be translated about 20 different ways. It can be, it's the Gore 8 sign, it means dove. It also means flood. It also means deep going ship. So it had these, it also means it's a unit of capacity. Uh, gore was a unit of capacity. So it was, a, it was a boat that carried many gores. Gores are like 300, um, 300 liters. That's what a gore, and it, so there's these cargo boats called gore boats. Ma just means boat. So anyway, so it's a big boat. It's a cargo boat. 
Gore can also represent Shiktu, an Akkadian, and that's an apprentice. It's someone, that's what a mathetes is. That's what a disciple is. It's an apprentice who's studying under a master. That's what it is. We would call it an apprentice today. Uh, and so the gore in this Momagor literally can be identified as an apprentice boat, as the boat of the apprentices. And you're like, oh, well, that's, that's the disciples. That's, that's how they knew the, the disciples were in this boat. That's where it's coming from. So again, I'm not trying to get it too linguistic or esoteric. I'm trying to Im Im embed your, your, your viewers into this really fascinating idea. So I keep the cuneiform in there so you can kind of learn to read a little cuneiform. And um, so, so now all of a sudden, this still frame takes on new meaning. So now you have Jesus in the guise of Orion stepping down from a mountain and taking his first step out onto the celestial sea. That is also the celestial sea that the disciples boat is sailing in, okay? So remember, this is a still frame, but these Lomashing writing puns, this polysemy in the archaic cuneiform spellings, they're imparting all the details. That's where these, you're gonna see that that's where these discrepancies in the story show up. So like, all right, so Jesus is doing this alone in, in uh, all of the, in the three versions of the story, Jesus walks on, he goes up and prays alone. So he's all alone up there. So that's pretty easy one to figure out too. Just above the Argo is the Hedra constellation. It's literally called the Mushush. Uh, in Akkadian, it's Mushushu. In Sumerian, it's Mushush, um, and one of its epithets is Ushum. Ushum just means serpent, um, but it's also <laughs> Ushum is also the Sumerian logogram, logogram that means Edeshu, which means alone in Akkadian. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's got the word alone embedded right in it. So right above the boat and right next to the mountains is the word alone which probably imparted the idea that Jesus did his praying. He goes up on this mountain. I'm sorry, he goes up on the mountain alone, okay? So, um, so he does it and it tells you the time. Like the time is the fourth watch of the night, which almost reads as a non sequitur. Like who cares what time he's, Jesus is walking on water. Like who cares what times he does it? It's like saying like Jesus walked on water and like he had a good haircut or something like that. Like it, it reads like a non sequitur. And you're like, all right, well, Matthew and uh, Matthew and Mark embedded in the story. So the fourth watch of the night, well, the, probably where they got that from, and I'm going from, uh, you can see I'm going on some of my older pictures here that I used for the scholarly version of, of this paper. But um, so the bull constellation is written with the goo four sign, goo number four. Just means alpu in Akkadian, means bull. It means gufor just means bull and smear. But gufor means many other words. One of them is rabu. And rabu is the word great. And rabu is also the word fourth. And I'm like, oh no, because then I know what the word I is. Enu. Enu is just the eye star. It's the brightest star in uh, the bull. It's Aldebaran. It's the bull's eye, literally the bull's eye. And it can be spelled enu. And when you see, um, a single, um, a two syllable word with a single uh, consonant, it's written with two cuneiform signs. And those cuneiform signs, I get what I'm trying to get at is doubled consonants aren't always shown in cuneiform. So whenever you see a cuneiform word and there's a line over the letter, that's not shown in the, the, the writing of cuneiform. It means that it is um, conveyed through context and a scholar would know it. Also, double uh, medial consonants, the double N sign, it's not shown. It can be shown, but it's not always shown. So, a cuneiform scholar would be, you know, an astrologer would know, oh, Enu, the I. So, if you double that cuneiform sign, you get E N N U. Oh, that's watch of the night. That just is a Sumerian term for one of the watches of the night. So, all of a sudden, embedded in this stellar picture story, you have the bull constellation right in front of Orion, conveying the words great and forth. 
and then also in the I star, you have watch of the night. So you have fourth watch of the night. So that's probably why uh, Matthew and Mark were so, they, they were just so committed to including this non sequitur, this, this piece of information that it seems extraneous. Why, why would you put it in there? They feel that it's very important because it's embedded in the celestial writing. Because it's there, I've got to include it here. If they found it, they included it. So the other thing is, uh, I think it's in Matthew and Mark, they refer to it as an opposing wind. And in John's version of Jesus' seawalk, they call it a great wind. Um, I'd have to look it up again, but it, I, it's in the book. I make I note the difference. It's also in the, the scholarly article that's in archaeoastronomy and ancient technology. So anyway, so again, we go back to that Magua boat, right? That disciples boat. It's written with cuneiform signs, Matu and Gore 8. Well, Gore 8 has, I mean, Gore 8 has a whole bunch of readings. I think it's got like 19 different readings. One of them is Gore, one of them is Two, and one of them is Hu. Gore can mean great in Sumerian, Tu can mean wind, and Hu can, can also be read Re, which means opposing. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden you have an opposing wind and a great wind. And that's probably, probably where um, you have uh, Matthew and Muc Matthew, sorry, Matthew and Mark, I've been talking for a while, talking about a contrary wind, an opposing wind, and John referring to the wind that, that is, uh, uh, you know, causing the, the boat to flounder as, an, as a, a great wind, okay? So all of a sudden, you, this stellar picture story, they're reading this celestial writing for tidbits of information that they're construing as unequivocal fact, un, 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 unadulterated. You, you wouldn't think of writing, not writing it down. So all of a sudden, you have a, a great wind, an opposing wind. The, the occurrence of the miracle is the fourth watch of the night. So Jesus always in every instance, he went away, he went up or went away, depending on your translation of the Greek, on a mountain to pray. We just saw what the mountain was, but where did all the praying come from? How did they know Jesus went up on this mountain and prayed? It's written as if it's eyewitness testimony. And you might say, well, they're writing 60 years after Jesus, at least, so Jesus dies in 33 AD. So they're writing at the earliest, they're writing in around, you know, four decades after Jesus died. How did they come up with this factual, this eyewitness information? Well, they've got a picture of it. It'd be the same as me, um, esoteric, handing you a, a snapshot, like taking it. Well, I, I sent you a picture of a Native American um, pictograph that we photographed the last week that that shows the summer solstice filling the headdress of a pictograph that's a factual incident and the the evangelist would say well look i can just look up the stars and i've got snapshots of every monumental incident that occurred in jesus's life all i got to do is read the celestial writing and it'll give me the facts upon which uh jesus's miracles are based and that's what i'm arguing here so um, so again, we're going to look at, uh, this one, the big one is, um, you want to look at Taurus again. Again, if you haven't look at, looked at, like, um, cuneiform lexicons, if you ever look at, you want to blow your mind away, go into a, a library and bust out the, I think it's 28 volumes of the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary. And like you, 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 first of all, you'll hurt yourself carrying them to the desk because they're so heavy. And there are so many variations of the constellation titles. I'm just going to give you some here. So Taurus, it can, it can be read Gu Four. That's the Sumerian. It's, they don't say the four. The four is a, it's just for the scholar. So we know which cuneiform signs inscribed. Um, it's written with the sign name that's called, the Gu4 sign is called Gud. It literally has a sign name, like the letter A is named A, the letter B is named B, 
but you don't read B when you're reading. You don't read like bug. You don't say B, U, G, you say B. Anyway, all the cuneiforms have that. They've got sign names. Anyway, so, cune so Taurus, one of its titles is Alu. That just is one of the titles for Taurus. And, you know, it means like bull, but it also means, you know, to go up or to go away. Another way to write Taurus, you can write it Lu, or you can write it in the old fashioned way, which is with a case ending, which is the um sound. Uh, it, they call it mimation in cuneiform. It's just, you stick a, an M at the end of the word. It just means you, here's your case ending. And loom is one way to write bull. And it also is the cuneiform word for to pray. And the I star in cuneiform can, you Aldebaran know, can be read igi. And igi can mean, you know, ana in, in Akkadian, which is the word too. So all of a sudden you have Christ, you know, the anointed one, right? He went up, he went away to the mountain alone to pray. And that's probably where uh, Matthew, Mark, and John got the, those details from, right? So, so here's, but here's probably the pictorial spiritual message. Remember, you're talking about the earliest converts, these first century converts to Christianity. Remember, it's a new religion. They're like, What's this religion going to do for me? Like, what is, what's the, what's the, what's the takeaway? What's, what's the payoff for converting to believing in Christ? Well, I think it's etched in the miracle of Jesus walking on water. So I tried to show it for you here. Um, so uh, you see the, um, the ecliptic passing through this, the zodiac signs there. You see Gemini, then you see uh, you see Pisces, the twins, then you see Aquarius, and then you see Capricorn. I'm going from left to right there. Well, that is the ecliptic. That's where the sun passes through the zodiac, right? Well, it's right next to where Jesus was, it or was, or is walking on the celestial waters. He's walking on a specific constellation. He's walking on cuneiform in cuneiform, what's called the Chubor. It's the, it's the river of death, okay? Every single soul had to navigate through the river of death if your soul was going to in, attain immortality. So this is an image of Jesus. Now remember, in cuneiform, he's what's called a, a Pashishu priest. In cuneiform, one of the ways to write it is it's a gudu, gudu apsu. Apsu is the wet region of the night sky. It's the celestial sea. And one of the main constellations is that in that celestial sea is the river of death. And in some cases it's called, I think in, in, in Greco-Roman um, celestial mythology, it's the, um, it's the river of death is like Styx, Styx. Uh, Stux, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, Iridanus in some cases, in the later, uh, when you get near around the time of Christ, you, you get stories about having to navigate this river of death. Well, Jesus, you know, is in, embodied in Orion. He's literally pictorially showing you what's going to happen to you if you become a Christian. You will become like Christ and you will be able to navigate or um, triumph over the river of death. You will be able to walk on water and you will not sink into the river of, river of death and your soul will gain immortality. So um, that's sort of the takeaway, I think, of uh, the, the, the celestial tableau of Jesus walking on water. So again, the book's called, oh, and by the way, so how did the, uh, the um, evangelists know about this. Well, there are many different ways. You know, Matthew mentions that Jesus' birth story was, was first, remember, here's what's astonishing in Matthew's gospel. So the only place we know about Jesus' birth is from Mary and Joseph. There's no one in Jesus' inner circle that was at his birth, okay? 
So in Matthew's gospel, the first people that know about Jesus's birth are Babylonian astrologers, the Magi. They come from Mesopotamia to Jerusalem following this star, which then hangs a left in Jerusalem and goes to Bethlehem. It goes like another four and a half miles south, parks over the house where Jesus is born. Like, and Matthew writes that down. So I'm pretty sure Matthew was a Mesopotamian Pupshado. He, he was indoctrinated into Mesopotamian celestial writing, constellation writing. If he didn't know it from Mesopotamia, he probably knew it from Daniel, who was a famous Mesopotamian astrologer. If you don't believe me, look at Daniel chapter 5, verse 11. Maybe the, they learned it from the Greeks, from Homer, who is an, his name means hostage, and he's very likely a Babylonian astrologer that was taken hostage by the Greeks. Um, the other possibility is Jesus himself. Remember, if you were a Jew or a Christian and you didn't convert to Christianity, you believed that Jesus performed all of his miracles uh, because he knew magical information. He, he was an astrologer. He was uh, a magi. He, he was a magician. And there's often images of him, like the one shown there, of him performing his miracles with a magic wand. So uh, anyway, that's what I think the basis of Jesus's um, celestial sea walk was founded on. And the book is called The Celestial Code of Scripture. I think it's chapter 12. It's called Jesus Celestial Sea Walk. And um, having said that, uh, I want to thank you for letting me present that to your viewers. Um, it was a lot of fun. I hope it wasn't too pedantic. I'm always worried about like having all these, you know, celestial word plays and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to be boring, you know, so. so. John McHugh, thank you. My pleasure. It was a pleasure.